Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here with us today. We just finished up a busy week of VBS. I know school's coming, so uh, many are out camping. There's some sickness going around, uh, but we're excited to get together here and worship together. I know God's got some awesome things in store for us uh, through the preaching today and also through the singing as we uh, desire to be more and more like Christ and come to worship and encourage one another in doing that. Just uh, before I do the call to worship, just want to give a shout out and thank all of you for the prayers for our VBS week. Uh, the Lord blessed us with bringing 235 kids to VBS. We had over 100 volunteers uh, that made it all possible, and we are just praising the Lord for the many decisions and the things that He did uh, in the hearts and lives of those kids. And then the last night, the last half hour, is our parent night. We have a big closing ceremony, and the gospel's given, and invites to church, and, and all these different things. Hi! <laughs> and uh, so, um, I have a fan. And uh, so we had a wonderful week, and so thank you for the prayers and for all the many that helped and donated food and time and then helped clean it all up. Uh, God did some awesome things. So we put together a really short, quick slideshow slash video. We're to watch that, and then uh, we'll give some more announcements and do our call to worship. The western desert hot and dry. a quick little highlight and just show you visually uh, just some of the things that happened this last week. We do want to just uh, thank, again, all of you that helped. And then also just a shout out to our Kidman director, Bethany Ross, for the many months of planning. I know how that goes. Uh, when you're running something, it's a lot of time and effort, and things were run very smoothly. So praise the Lord for her and all that effort. And the many that helped uh, with making the week a success. God was so good. Hey, a couple quick announcements won't be in the video announcement at the end. Uh, we do have our men's pig out coming up. That's for ages 12 years old, the guys and up. And uh, this is a great opportunity to invite some of your friends, maybe some unsafe friends to come. Uh, there'll be, uh, you know, everyone's invited to bring their, uh, their firearms. We have a rifle range. We have trap shooting, uh, handgun range. Uh, we're going to have a, a smoked meat meal, uh, possibly catered. And then uh, Tom Chapman is going to be bringing a gospel message. And so uh, we would love to see our men come out. And then many in the community to come out and uh, hear the gospel, connect with our church people, and uh, see what God does through that. That's on August 20th from 10 a.m. to noon. And then today, uh, to one. 
apologize. So 10 to 1. And then right after church today, uh, we're making our way over to the park. We have the picnic in the park. Everyone's just to bring their own food for themselves and their family. Uh, but we'll have spike ball and some other things set up and just a great time of fellowship. Uh, we've just come off of a couple very busy weeks through camps for youth camps and VBS. And so uh, for those that are able to come and join us and just relax in the park and fellowship, we'd love to invite you to come. Uh, all are welcome. Uh, for a call to worship this morning, we'll be in Psalm chapter 30 and in verse 4. The Bible says this, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. We serve a holy and an awesome God. And we have visibly watched God do some incredible things and work miracles in the hearts and lives of young people over this last month and use us as fallen man uh, to be used for his glory and to accomplish much for him. And so we have much to praise him for, much to be thankful for. And let's, so let's, with that in mind, go to the Lord today and, and ask him to give us that heart of worship and praise for he is an awesome God. And so let's do that today. Dear Lord, we love you so much and we are so thankful for who you are. We're thankful, Lord, that even though you don't need us, you choose to use us if we're willing and if our hearts are pure and right before you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done in changing hearts and lives this past month through the different ministries here at this church. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to follow up with the people that we know uh, that made some decisions or people that we invited to church and that we'd invite them back and that we would do Bible studies with them, invite them into our homes with the, with the goal of continuing to give them the gospel and be a light for you and point people to you. Thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship you today. We pray that you'd be pleased with it and honored with it. We pray these sings your name. Amen. Let's all stand together and let's join our worship team as we begin singing this morning. Encamped upon the hills of mighty Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below let all our strength be heard of triumph drawn. By faith they like a whirlwind's crest and dawn o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the Salvation's helmet on each head with two. 
is not by our works, but it is by faith that we come to know Jesus Christ, and it is through uh, that faith that we can have our sins forgiven and a home in heaven, and uh, the Lord wants us to share that good news with others, and so we've done that at VBS, but it should not just be at VBS. Let's be doing that all the time. Now let's sing, oh, praise the name uh, together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet. I say, Your days we will sing your praise 
And here on earth, that's even through bad things that are going on, we will sing his praise. Why? Because he is an awesome God. He deserves our praise, and he's already given us all so much. And so when we go through those hardships and those trials, he still deserves those praises because he's good, and only he can help us through the things that we're experiencing to bring himself glory through all those trials that he allows in our life. Sometimes self-inflicted that we bring on ourselves, and some just because of the sin-cursed world that we live in. So, uh, man, what a great song to sing praise to the Lord for endless days we will do that. I hope you are. We're continuing to give of our tithes and our offerings as part of our worship here in person. Uh, you can give and place that uh, envelope, uh, your offering in the offering boxes, out in the uh, entrances as you come and you go. You also can give online uh, through our First Baptist Church website and through our app. Uh, but we'll continue worshiping at this time. Jesus, Messiah.
aren't you thankful that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become his righteousness? If you're there this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter uh, how you grew up or, or any of those things. Jesus loves you, and he died on the cross for you. And the Bible says if you will confess your sins, if you're tired of fighting those sins and carrying that guilt, to give it to God, ask forgiveness. And the Bible says that he will not only forgive you of your sins, but he'll adopt you into his family giving you a home in heaven one day. And so aren't you thankful that he did that? Jesus, our Messiah. Let's finish out this morning by singing Loved Before the Dawn of Time. job singing. You may be seated. We are grateful for salvation song. It's interesting of all of the creatures that the Lord created, man is the only one who can sing redemption song. The angels can't sing the redemption song. They are sealed, but we can, and we're thankful for the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our service today, we have a guest with us who's been preaching that same gospel message for decades. 
And uh, I count Jim Plunkett as a close friend. Ever since I've been here in the Northwest, he has taken time to drive from Spokane up here, uh, both to mentor and befriend me. We have enjoyed conferences together. And though he's not going to be preaching the morning service, I have asked him to address our congregation this morning. So I'm going to ask Brother Jim if he'll go ahead and come forward. And he's going to take five or ten minutes here at the beginning of the service. And we're grateful, my friend, to have you with us today. Well, Joseph he doesn't know me very well when he said five, ten minutes. <laughs> No, we'll try to honor that. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And in his, delight, in his word he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water. He shall bring forth his fruit and his season, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? I'm here this morning to celebrate 60 years of preaching the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here... I'm here to celebrate that 60 years ago on a Sunday evening, I preached the first sermon I ever preached here in Colville at First Baptist Church in the public library. <laughs> That's where they were meeting there. It was a Sunday evening. We drove up from Spokane. At that time, in the early days of Colville, Pastor Haig, who was my pastor for over 25 years, the pastor of Euclid Avenue Baptist Church, was a great supporter of starting churches and a great supporter of the starting of the First Baptist Church of Colville. And the pastor needed to be gone, and th three of us young men came up to preach, so I didn't preach the whole sermon. I preached a third of it. And we, uh, it was Gary Carpenter and Rob Sarr and Pastor Haig's daughter. We came up here. We found the library. We had the service, and I preached out of Psalm 42, as the, as the deer panteth for the water brook, so my heart panteth for the Lord. And I'm sure I didn't understand it. I don't know that I understand it fully today. But I know that real peace, as we heard in Sunday school today, real joy in life comes from seeking the face of God and living for him. It's been a great privilege to be a part of this church for that 60 years. I've preached here many, many times. I've driven up here on nice days, and I've driven here in snowstorms with snow walls between the road. And my Volkswagen freezing, but you didn't have to worry about getting off the road because there was no place to go. <laughs> and then in 1973, almost 50 years ago, this church supported my wife, Carol, who's with me today, my wife, Carol, and my two daughters, we went to Togo, Africa with ABWE, one of our very first supporters, and one of the most exciting supporters we've had in the 50 years has been the First Baptist Church of Colville. And so I'm here to thank you for that, for the privilege of being a part of your missionary family, having served in Togo, West Africa, having served in Portugal for 18 years, Togo for four years, Portugal for 18 years, and then Ghana, West Africa for six years. And except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. And none of us know what our life is accomplishing and what our ministry, but I will tell you, I am convinced, and I know it sounds trite, I've said it here many times, but only one life will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ will last. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. It's been my privilege over the last 60 years in West Africa, Togo and Ghana and Portugal, to have had a part of founding and starting some 10 churches. But what is exciting today is many of those churches are much larger than they ever were when I was there. 
and particularly in Portugal, where we've seen churches having to enlarge their facilities and push out the walls in order to accomplish. They just finished, as you have here, two weeks of camp and then Bible schools in the local churches. I just got word in the camp, which the facility was one of the last projects that Carol and I had, the Lisbon Training Center, which you generously supported and gave money for, and which were led. There was campers there from every one of the churches that ABDA started, and every one of them had campers there and had volunteers there working. And that's a testimony to the grace of God and to the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I continue after 60 years to be convinced that the primary thing that we as churches need to be doing and we as Christians is preaching the glorious gospel that there is salvation only by faith, faith only in Christ only. And I am more and more convinced that we need to be determined to preach Christ and him crucified. Yes, we need to teach the whole counsel of God. We need to teach all through the Bible. But dear friends, we must be committed that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God except by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your help in our new building and moving out of the old building and moving everything, coming down that hour and a half, almost two hours down to the valley and then helping us move back. We thank you very much for that. We thank you for your prayers for Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. We thank you for being a part of, to even today, a part of your missionary family. We thank you. And we thank you for your testimony in this part of the world and your encouragement to other churches to keep on keeping on and to be faithful in this day. I trust that we'll continue to work together and that Psalm 42 will continue. As I mentioned, we spoke on that the 60 years ago when the first time I spoke up here in the library. But I trust we'll continue to seek God and thirst after God, thirst after the word of God, that we might bring honor and glory to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for your pastors. I appreciate Pastor Dennis and Pastor Dave so much. They both invested much time and energy in our church as you have and I thank you and I want to pray for them and for you all at this time our gracious heavenly father I lift my voice and praise to you for your salvation I thank you heavenly father for your grace that brought us to you and saved us not by works of righteousness we have done but according to your mercy and your grace I pray for pastor Dennis and pastor Dave I thank you for them I thank you for their hard work and their diligence to preach the gospel in this corner of Washington and to reach out that men and women and boys and girls might come to a saving knowledge of the Savior. I pray you would increase them, give them health, give their family health. Bless them, Heavenly Father, as they minister the word of God, as they stand for the, toot, the truth unflinching in this part of the world. And may it be an act, a testimony and encouragement to us all. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for this church's great interest in mission, their provision for me and my family over 50 years, and Heavenly Father, for their continual efforts to strengthen the work here in eastern Washington, to strengthen the work of the gospel throughout the Northwest, and Heavenly Father, around the world as they continue to support and train and, and encourage missionaries. Heavenly Father, I thank you for First Baptist Church of Kabul, for their history, their rich history. And I pray that until Christ comes in the air for us, that this church will be faithful to preaching the gospel and faithful to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I think of a, for us older preachers, it yeah. would be a rail. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your friendship, Brother Jim, and um, thank you for the encouragement that you have been to us and, um, and to First Baptist Church, your faithful years on the mission field and continuing to preach the gospel. It is an inspiration, certainly. Uh, 
We're going to continue on in our series this morning on missional leadership. We're in 1 Timothy. We've made it to chapter 6. This is our 15th week to be in 1 Timothy. Um, we're going to be in reading verses 6 through 10 this morning, 6 through 10. And the topic that is addressed by Paul to Timothy, this young pastor, is that of contentment. And since I know that none of you would have a problem with contentment, this should be an easy message this morning. All right, 1 Tim Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, this is what the Bible says. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content, but they would be they that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the topic today is, is contentment. Um, and we live in a world that struggles to be Content. It was just two weeks ago when we, we looked at the end of chapter 5, or actually we were in verses 1 through uh, 5, and he's talking about uh, some of the uh, preachers who are saying, hey, listen, um, we judge people's godliness by how much they, uh, finances they have, how rich they are. And Paul turns around and says, that's not how we judge spirituality. Godliness with contentment is how we judge spirituality. And so um, let me begin just quickly with an illustration that might help to guide our attention um, to this topic of contentment. There was, once upon a time, there was a white knight, and he was looking for adventure, and he came across a town, and in that town there was a legend that told of a terrible ogre that lived down in a pit. And, um, and so there had been um, many individuals who had gone into the pit and had never returned. And so since he was for adventure, he went and stared down into the deep, dark pit. He secured a rope and he realized that the armor that he was wearing was much too thick to fit down into that small hole. And so um, he took off all of his armor and only with a dagger around his neck, he hand over hand descended down into the pit. And when his feet finally reached hard ground and his eyes adjusted to the darkness, um, he could see that there was a large pile of something, a mound of something, and he made his way over to it and he realized that those were the bones and the weapons of his predecessors. The ogre must have gotten to them. And so um, he quickly picked up one of the swords that had been discarded uh, by one of these uh, previous heroes that had fallen in battle. And then the ogre came out. It was the size of a rabbit. And he was, he, surely this could not be the ogre. And um, he chased after it with his sword, but it was quick like a mouse, and it ran in behind another mound. So he made his way over to the mound to try to dig out the ogre who he was going to quickly dispatch. And the mound was gold and diamonds. The smallest piece of gold was the size of an apple and the smallest diamond the size of a plum. And he realized that if just a little bit of this treasure could set up a man as a prince for life, and realizing that the ogre wasn't a problem, he was trying to figure out, how am I going to get all of this treasure out through such a small hole? And so he devised himself a plan. He decided that he would take the largest diamond that he could fit into his mouth, and he would crawl back up through the hole, and then he would come back and get other treasure later. And so that's what he did. He put the diamond in his mouth. He used his tongue to hold it against the roof of his mouth. And hand over hand, he climbed back up the rope. But it was exhausting. And breathing through his nose was just not enough to get oxygen into his lungs. And so quickly, he decided he would just take one deep breath. And the diamond lodged in his throat. 
and he fell from his rope onto the pile where his predecessors lay. Because the terrible ogre in the pit was not the rabbit-sized troll. It was greed. And today we live in a world that is choking itself to death with greed. What more can I get? You know, it used to be before the age of the internet, and I know some of the children, even some of the young adults don't remember that there ever wasn't an internet. Yeah, Al Gore invented it in 1995. (laughs) You have to go see the interview to understand that. Um, So, there was no internet, and I can still remember the commercials were the way that we were indoctrinated into the idea that we didn't have enough. In the early 80s, there were commercials for special toys like Stretch Armstrong. What boy didn't want Stretch Armstrong? You could stretch his arms out. We tried forever, and, you know, and he would retain his shape eventually. And then the Evil Knievel. Do you guys remember Evil Knievel? They'd have these wind-up racers or they have the rip cords on the back of the wheel. I mean, when we went outside and played, this is the kind of stuff we did, you know? And so we were indoctrinated by commercials into the idea that you don't have enough. And now all you have to do is pull up Amazon and they will tell you what you don't have yet. You have everything except for this matching set. And if you happen to mention it out loud while you're with your phone sitting around, the next time you pick it up, there'll be an ad running down the side of the page. It's creepy. <laughs> Advertising has taken on a whole new realm of you should be discontent because you don't have enough. But look how Apostle Paul talks about contentment in our text today. In verse number six, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment starts with realizing that all the material things that you have are only temporary. So let's begin first of all by breaking down our passage of scripture into two points. And the first one here is the wonder of godliness. The wonder of godliness. And what is, the, what is godliness? Godliness is simply this, doing what is pleasing to God. Not a real deep definition, but certainly if we were to live it out, uh, a very impactful one, doing those things that are pleasing to God. That's what godliness is, and it appears that godliness and contentment cannot be separated from one another. For if we were to experience, if we want to experience godliness, we, or I mean contentment, we must become godly. Ungodliness is a source of discontentment. This is the wonder of godliness. Doing what pleases God will bring the greatest contentment in life. Because contentment does not rest in the things which we possess. How many of you have ever gotten a new thing and quickly that new thing wore off, the newness of it wore off, and you no longer were impressed by it? You just had to have it before you had it, and now that you have it, it's not as impressive as you thought it was. If you have not yet experienced that, then you must be a child. And probably children have experienced this at, to greater extent at Christmas time. Please, please, mom and dad, I must have that toy, that thing, that electronic device. Only to by 6 p.m. on Christmas Day have discarded it and are playing with the box. (laughs) Leonard Ravenhill said, if we displease God, does it matter whom we please? And if we please God, does it matter whom we displease? Godliness is doing what is pleasing to God. Then what is biblical contentment? Biblical contentment is being completely satisfied with what God has given to us. See, Paul taught to the Philippian church, just as he's teaching Timothy now, that we must learn to be content in whatsoever state we find ourselves. In Philippians chapter 4, 
verses 11 through 13, as he writes to the church at Philippi, Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, for I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. And then the famous verse that is quoted out of context so frequently, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That is not your sports team's verse. That is the verse that says, I have learned how to conduct myself when I have plenty and to be content with what God has given me. And I have learned when I don't have enough, when I feel like I have lost it all and, and I'm starting over again, I'm content because I know that God loves me and he sees me and he cares for me. And if he cares for the sparrow who falls, and I'm not going to quote all of Matthew chapter 5, but if, if he knows the number of hairs on my head and he, and he feeds the sparrow and he takes care of the flowers, I know that he will take care of me. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. It's the realization of how much you already have. Maybe one of the most powerful illustrations I have of this, um, I'll, I'll quote it here in just a minute. Let me give you a news report from 1999. Um, according to U.S. News Report in 1999, it's uh, a world report says, for Americans with household incomes under $25,000, it would take $54,000 a year to fulfill their version of the American dream. So if they're making less than twenty five, dollars they're saying, hey, listen, if I had fifty-four. dollars I'm in the money, right? Life is good. I could do everything that I want to do in my life if I just had $54,000. Now, this is interesting because they asked people who made $100,000 a year, what would it take to realize the American dream? And they said, only $192,000. And I could live the dream, the American dream that I think, you know, that I see of the things that I want, that's all it would take. Do you realize that each category that they asked, that it was double whatever they thought they were at right now? It, and if you think Christians are exempt, you're silly. We as Christians, we are supposed to be content with what God has given to us. Now listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't work hard. That's a biblical instruction. And it's not wrong to have dreams. It's not wrong to desire um, to, to move forward. It's not wrong to have ambition. My question is, but if we can't even enjoy what God has given us now, how are we going to enjoy what God gives us later? Because there'll always be something more. There'll always be something past that. It's never going to end until we get to the grave and then we realize we can't even take it with us. And we spent all that time on the hamster wheel. We were never content. We never experienced happiness because it was always just over the next hill. William Boyce once wrote, I love this. This is the one that I thought it maybe have shaped my mind regarding contentment. He said, Dear Lord, I've been rereading the record of the rich young ruler and his obviously wrong choice. Remember he, the rich young ruler who was asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord says, sell everything that you have, you know, um, and he, he walks away sad, right? He walks away sad. He says um, he made a wrong choice, but it set me to thinking no matter how much wealth that young man had, he could not ride in a car, have corrective surgery, turn on a light bulb, buy penicillin, hear a pipe organ, watch TV, have indoor plumbing to wash the dishes, type out a letter, mow a lawn, fly in an airplane, sleep on an inner spring mattress. Talk on the phone. If he was rich, then what am I? Mankind has a tendency to run to everything else but God looking for contentment. 
And the only type of comparison a Christian should be doing is comparing how our lives would be different if we didn't have what God has supplied for us right now. In fact, in 1 Timothy, in our main text, verse number 7, it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. A lot of old-time preachers used to say you never see a hearse, you know, uh, with a U-Haul behind it. I think often that comes from the statement that you hear quoted often about John D. Rockefeller Sr., who was, by all measurements, the richest man of his generation. His accountant was asked, how much did Rockefeller leave when he died? And the accountant, without pausing, said, everything. Does it matter how much? Because it all gets left behind, which is why in the book of Matthew, we're told under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the writer Matthew, and he says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where thieves can't break through and steal and moth and rust don't corrupt, right? He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven because we will leave behind everything. The wonder of godliness is this. When we are godly, we are also content. You ever had to take a test more than once? I think contentment is one of those tests. There's a time in our life, sometimes we think like, oh yeah, I got it. I'm content. I feel it. I mean, I, I, if the Lord never didn't give me one more thing, I'm just, I'm just content with what he's given me. There are times and then there's, you know, then something drives by or we see, you know, and you're like, I mean, I was content just a few minutes ago. I was, I was content. We, we, this is going to be a struggle for us. Can I say that even in our, our churches, we're going to struggle with contentment, but we ought to struggle for contentment, and we ought to struggle for godliness. We ought to say, Lord, make me godly that I might experience your contentment. So we have the wonder of godliness, but we also have the warning of greed, and we find it in verse number nine, the warning of greed. In verse number nine, the Bible says, once again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. They that will be rich. If we were just to translate that into our normal vernacular out of the King James English, it means desire to be rich. Not that are rich, not that experience financial blessing, but that's their desire. They're wrapped up in it. Their only desire, their only motivation in life is I will be rich. It's, a, it's a, not an emotional response, but a reasoned Settled desire, I will be rich. And greedy people are continually entrapped by their consuming drive for more. I mean, they asked Henry Ford one time, how much more? And he said, one dollar more. Greedy people continually entrapped. Their pursuit is their passion. It becomes compulsive and it controls their life. Um, we often say this, it is okay to have things, but it is not okay when things have you. In Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, we'll put the verse up on the screen for you this morning, you mark it in your notes, chapter 7, verse number 25. This is Moses writing and speaking to the people of Israel before they go into the promised land. They're on the bank of the Jordan River, which has overflowed its banks. They're waiting to go in. The first city that they're going to encounter is Jericho. But inside of, of the um, promised land are, is all the land that God promised them. But listen to the instruction that Moses gives. He says, the graven images of their God, speaking of those inside the promised land, the pagans, he says, the graven images of their gods, ye shall burn with fire, ye shall not desire their silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. He says, listen, that first city, when you go in to take it in the nation of Jericho, uh, that, just leave all the gold and silver there. You're, he's like, you're missing the point of the promised land. 
This is a land I'm going to give you, but, but it's not going to be so that you can just be rich. It's so that you can be my people and I can be your God and you can be a light to the nations for the gospel. And so, why does he warn them about heaping riches? He says, because this leads to foolish and hurtful lusts that ruin men. The word in my Bible, drown men in destruction, perdition, that word drown, um, is the Greek word that means to sink, to submerge, to drag to the bottom. Greed will drag you to the bottom. The Bible contains many examples of those destroyed by the love of money. And since I already mentioned Jericho, we might as well bring in Achan. Achan loved money. You say, well, who was Achan? Achan was a Israelite who uh, didn't listen to the instruction that Moses gave the people. So they get into Israel. They get to the first city. They do everything they're supposed to do. They're quiet when they walk around. They blow the trumpets. The, the walls of Jericho fall, right? I have a hard time not singing the song when we, when we do that for the kids, right? So um, the, the walls of Jericho fall down and they go in and they're not supposed to take any of the gold or silver or raiment or anything out of the city of Jericho. That was the instruction that was given. Achan takes a little bit of everything, he hides it, buries it underneath his tent. They go, it's chapters long, so they go, I'm giving you the cliff note version. They go through the tribes, and then they go through the families, and then they get all the way down to, it's Achan. And so Achan comes out, and he brings out the gold, the silver, and he piles it up there. And um, meanwhile, Israel had sent men up to Ai to have a battle, and and they lost against a much smaller city and not fortified because God had removed his hand of blessing from them. And they were asking, why did this happen? And they find out it was Achan's fault. He, he trespassed the commands of God. And so because he would be rich, what happened? Uh, he was killed. His family was killed. And Israel, we had 36 men from Israel die in battle because of Achan's sin. Why? Because this sin of greed doesn't just touch the person who's greedy. It also touches Everyone around them. Judas. He had a problem with the love of money. For 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 in our text, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This pull is so strong this pull for the desire for the next thing, once greed is inside of us, is so strong that it will cause us to leave the faith in order to pursue after this present world. And can I just say, discontentment is expensive. Because in order to get to the next thing, you got to buy it. And so, it's expensive. I, I think of others in Scripture, and Demas, having loved this present, has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Uh, not only has the love of money caused individuals to turn their back on God, they have pierced themselves through, it says, with many sorrows. One commentator uh, said it like this, like an animal placed on a spit, they have skewered their own souls and brought themselves unbelievable grief, a condemning conscience, unfulfilled desires, dissatisfaction, and disillusionment are their reward. Isn't it amazing? We thought that thing was going to bring happiness, and it didn't. Why? Because things were never designed to bring happiness. Only God can do that our relationship and our walk for the Lord. And then things are just the icing on the cake. See, even as Christians, sometimes we're tempted to try to fill up on the icing. That's a recipe for sickness. It tastes good going down for a little while. But that can't be your diet. Do you know the missionary C.T. Studd? Are you familiar with his story? If not, in our library we have a missionary series and one of the books is on his life. I hope that sometime that you get an opportunity to read about him. He was um, 19th century England's greatest cricket star. Now, I'm not, I don't follow cricket, so if you ask me like after church, hey, pastor, I'm also a cricket fan, I will know nothing about cricket. But I just happen to know that he was a cricket fan 
star. So much so that he amassed a fortune. Not only was his family wealthy, but he amassed a fortune being a cricket player. In fact, um, he was worth 29,000 pounds when he retired from cricket. And um, that is uh, roughly $2 million today. So not bad for uh, playing a game. But he sat in a revival meeting and gave his heart to Christ and decided he wanted to be a missionary to Africa. And he determined that he would give away all of his financial uh, ties to this world in order to leave. And so in 1887, he sat down and his accountant tells the story in his uh, biography about um, he wasn't sure how much he really had because some of it was tied up in investments. And so he thought he was worth 29, so he wrote $25,000 worth of checks in one day so he could just be, get it over with. Listen, they have a record of who he sent checks to. I like this. He sent $5,000 or pounds to D.L. Moody to start um, a, um, a ministry in a uh, foreign country, but um, that was never accomplished. So D.L. Moody took the $5,000 and started Moody Bible Institute. He sent $5,000 to George Mueller to help with the orphanage. He sent $5,000 to George Holland, who was renowned for working in London with the poor. He wanted to make sure that the poor had, they had soup kitchens and all those types of things and wanted to make sure that they were fed. He sent $5,000 to, um, it wasn't William Booth, it was his counterpart in England, but it was for the Salvation Army. Uh, he sent 5,000 pounds to the Salvation Army. And the rest he gave to various organizations. And the one I'm going to put down... Um, so, so he wrote, he wrote those four checks worth 5,000, there's $20,000, and he gave